So welcome. If you're here, you're probably trying to learn about uh, any of the new features that came out in the 1.4 release of VM Recovery Manager. I've done a few previous recordings on the 1.3 release that cover uh, the HA cases configuration deployments, and then as well as the uh, the disaster recovery uh, deployments. I did a separate series on that. In this particular one, I thought I'd take a different approach. Um, I've been playing with the latest release, and I'll take you through a tour of some of the things that have changed. Um, I currently logged on to the actual interface, and you'll notice um, it looks almost the same as before, but there's a number of really nice enhancements. Um, so I'll take you through those guys, and then I'll kind of give you a checklist of what I think are the top 10 new features in the uh, latest release. So let's go ahead and get to it. All right, so for starters, I figured I would go ahead and log into the actual Cases controller and show you Cases Manager Query version, show you that I'm playing with the latest release. So this is a version 1.4 uh, Cases Cluster configuration. I do have Service Pack 1 deployed, which just literally came out days ago. And uh, if I do a Cases Manager Query Cases Cluster, what you'll see here is my cluster name is HANA underscore VMR underscore DR, so my cluster type, and I happen to be playing with uh, underlying Linux HANA instances. Um, so I gave it a name that actually made sense to me. And then this is a type DR cluster configuration. I do have other clusters as type as, uh, configured as type HA, and I have been ex also experimenting with a type HADR, which is new to the 1.4 release. Uh, so I'll show you some details about that as well. The final piece that I'll show you, if I do a cases manager query system status, um, I'll show you that this uh, cluster configuration is up and ready to go. But what you'll notice when the output actually comes back is you'll see a few things that were not available in the previous releases. So for example, my site names do still continue to be the same. Um, I do have that HANA host group that I went ahead and I created. And then there's a few things that are different. So these work groups were not available in the previous releases. I'll explain to you what those guys are as I go through the recording today. Uh, so let's go ahead and get to it. And I'll show you uh, what I think are the top 10 line items in the 1.4 release. All right, so number one, um, we now have a third cluster topology type, so called HADR. So when we first came out with the release, we actually came out with the DR option, and we forked off into two offerings. So the easiest way to explain this is we do have a VM recovery manager for HA, for a local data center solution where maybe you're playing with a shared storage configuration, you can have a grouping of systems, you can elect which of the VMs are going to actually be managed, and then if one of them fails, we'll automatically try to restart them in place if that server is still available, or we'll restart them on the next available host. Uh, but you are playing it within the realm of a shared storage configuration. I noticed that that cases is set up as a type HA cases. Um, with the VM Recovery Manager for DR, all that we're doing is taking a Cases LPAR, deploying him as a type DR, and what that lets us do is leverage block level replication from one site to the next, and take managed VMs and be able to relocate them from one site to the other side. Uh, what we've introduced in the 1.4 release is now we have a third option. So if you look on the bottom of the screen, I've got an HADR Cases configuration, where now I can manage a grouping of systems within the first site. And then those VMs, if I elect to manage them, can be automatically restarted within this, the first site. And then it still gives me uh, the user initiated capability to go ahead and relocate those LPARs from site to site. In previous releases, we could not do that particular piece. So now we have three different cluster topology types, still leveraging the block level replication between the two sites, but now with that HADR configuration, having the ability to automatically restart the VMs, again, within the grouping of servers at the primary location. So that kind of gives you the side by side view. Um, in my particular deployment, um, when I went ahead and deployed this, I made my cases LPAR an HADR configuration. So it did require for me to wipe out the old config and lay him back down as type HADR. And in this configuration, I do require the VIO servers to be at the very latest and greatest. There is an additional e-fix that they recommend in the documentation. I made sure I went ahead and I loaded that uh, on all of my participating VIO servers. And then the other requirement in this type of configuration, if you sat through the VMR4HA video series, you're probably aware that within 
the VMR HA configuration deployment, there is the requirement for a, uh, a pair of shared LUNs. Uh, the VMR solution will automatically create a shared storage pool cluster and will use those disks to uh, facilitate the communication with the underlying managed VMs. So in this configuration at the primary site, however many servers I had there at the primary location would have to see those same two LUNs across all of the participating VIO servers. So it's still only two disks, but they would have to be mapped to every single one of those servers. Beyond that particular piece, what this type of deployment lets me do is manage VMs, which I'm reflecting at the very bottom left of the screen, where if we detect a failure of an individual VM or if the host goes down, we can go ahead and automatically restart those guys within that primary site. Notice that I highlight the fact that these are within the realm of a shared storage configuration. And then I now have the ability to do the user initiated DR movements, whether they are planned, unplanned, um, leveraging block level replication between the sites. So I'd have to have that replication established with one of the supported mechanisms. And then if I elect to leverage uh, the, the flash copy functionality and I assigned yet a third set of volumes, I could initiate DR rehearsals or perform DR testing and have the solution automatically create clones of my VMs at the remote location uh, without any impact to production. I covered that in the previous se series recordings, completely optional, but to me that's one of the nicest features to have in this particular solution. Um, one of the actual uh, hidden different type of cases configurations or not not so much hidden but maybe we don't advertise it as much um, we can leverage the block level replication by default in an asynchronous fashion and i highlight the storage types that we support on the right hand side uh, we can revert that replication to synchronous mode so when we set up vmr clusters as type dr we have that type of configuration there's also another mode so if you do happen to have a hyper swap deployment um, or a stretch cluster configuration, whether it's with IBM storage or OEM storage like EMC and Hitachi, you can have that type of deployment and set up the VMR for DR cluster in what we call a shared mode, which I highlight in the center of the screen. If we set it, as, set it up as type shared, we don't have to register the storage subsystems into the VMR cases, and we can still relocate the VMs from one side to the other side without having to leverage block level replication. So the combination is supported, is well documented, but sometimes kind of flies under the radar. So in my particular deployment, I went ahead and I deployed my cases, which is highlighted up on the top right as a type HADR configuration. I happen to have a grouping of HANA instances with the corresponding uh, HANA app servers, and I have HANA system replication taking place. And what I can do is I'm leveraging flash copy mappings. So if I want to do a DR test operation, I can have the solution automatically create clones at the remote site. I can go ahead and have those VMs automatically get restarted. So if they take a failure in the primary host, if it were to go down, they will automatically get restarted and disappear off of the source machine as soon as that host comes back online. Um, if I'm still starting from the left hand side, I do have the capability to do that user initiated DR operation from the primary site to the secondary site. And when we do that, we effectively gracefully shut down on the primary side, we create the profiles, and then we clean them up off of the source. So again, I get the best of both worlds. I get the HA capabilities within the primary site, where by default, I will automatically restart the VMs, and I get the user-initiated capability to relocate those LPARs from site to site. Um, if I start getting into the actual interface itself, the reason I'm showing you screenshots is because my cases is currently deployed as type DR, uh, but we did leverage the same exact UI server that you deploy, and what will happen is it will automatically detect if your cases cluster is set up as type HADR. When we do that, you get both sets of functionality within the same interface. So when this cases was set up as type HADR, I get tabs. Uh, so if you look on the top, you'll see the HA portion of the environment and then the DR capabilities of the, in the environment. Um, if I show you the side by side, if I'm in the HA tab, uh, what you'll see is I happen to click onto one of the managed VMs on the left hand side. And then on the right hand side, you see that I get the local mobility operations like live partition mobility would be under migrate, the remote restart capabilities would be under the restart section. And then if I load up the bottom half and I was clicked onto the DR environment tab, what you'll see is in this particular instance, I was clicked onto the actual host group. 
uh, HANA HADR host group at, uh, in that particular configuration. And then what you see on the right hand side is you see the site to site movement operations at either the site level, the host group level, which is what I actually happen to be clicked on, and then also the fa failover rehearsal operations. So again, we totally accommodate within the user interface for an HADR cases cluster configuration. So number two would be asymmetric host groups. So you might be asking yourself, what is the difference? What is an asymmetric host group? So what we had in the 1.3 release in previous releases is whenever you established uh, a pairing of the systems, so if I had site one on the left and site two on the right, I could effectively say that all the VMs that I'm managing on the left-hand side, uh, that particular host would be paired up with a matching host on the right-hand side. And it's easy to see when I only have two hosts, one on the left and one on the right. But if I started to have multiple hosts across my sites, the VMs from the top uh, left host could only stay within that host pairing. Now that was a requirement in the previous releases. So I show you the syntax uh, for a symmetric host group where the VMs had to stay within those host pairings. And now what we introduced in the one that four release is the ability to define asymmetric host groups. And the reason I'm showing it with three systems in this particular configuration is because that's what I'm playing with in my environment, but I could have many more systems on the left-hand side and then um, a lesser amount of systems. So now I can have a many to one type of relationship in the one that four release. The reason this is important is because now I can have VMs that live across multiple systems maybe go to a single DR target at the remote location. So to me, that's one of the uh, really nice enhancements that came into the mix in the 1.4 release. Now from the GUI itself, if I go down and I select the HANA uh, particular host group that I had to find, there is nothing here to tell me that this is an asymmetric uh, host group. But what I can do is I can go ahead and go into the uh, cases itself and if I run a cases manager query host group what you'll see is here's the one that I actually created the HANA VMR HG which you're seeing in the GUI you see the home site hosts so I have a many to one relationship the backup site host it's another S822 and then the last piece that I'll highlight here if you look at the bottom there's the asymmetric type now, by default, every time that you define the cases, he's going to go ahead and create a default host group, and that particular one happens to be empty. I'm using one where I pick the name, and the default one is a symmetric type uh, host group. So just wanted to show you the contrast between the two. I happen to be using asymmetric in my config so that I can have eight, uh, a many-to-one configuration. All right, so number three, VM workgroups, another new feature in the 1.4 release where now, now that you understand what an asymmetric host group is, if I have many servers on site one going to maybe a single system on site B, maybe I want to move um, specific LPARs or VMs from one site to the other one. So now what I'm allowed to do is effectively create a VM workgroup, and I purposely classified them into colors so that it was easy to see. Uh, so maybe those are SLES VMs. And then I have another VM workgroup, but notice that all of those light blue uh, LPARs maybe span across the three different systems. And I don't want to move at the system level. I want to move that particular grouping of VMs. And then I created a single VM workgroup. So in the past, we've been asked, can you move a single VM at a time? This would be an easy way if I created a single VM workgroup um, where I could move a single VM between the sites. Now, that gives me the ability to specify what grouping I'm actually going to go ahead and move. Um, and in my particular environment, I had a grouping of seven LPARs that I was managing, and I created two separate VM workgroups. And I'm not exactly laid out like this. All of mine are actually stashed on the left-hand side. But maybe in a real-life deployment, I would see something like um, a grouping of VMs sitting on system A, and then a separate grouping of VMs sitting on system B, and I could move them um, in that type of fashion going across to the second location. Uh, note that this particular option only exists when your cases is configured as type DR. So let me go ahead and go into the UI server and show you exactly what that looks like. If I go into the GUI itself, um, you'll see that I'm under my HANA VMR cases. If I start expanding my primary site, you'll see that I've got the actual host group defined. And if I go ahead and I expand that host group, you'll see the two hosts that I was actually talking about. 
um, the two serial numbers show up or that the names of the systems and the corresponding serial numbers show up on mouse over and then what you'll see is here's host group one I happen to call it HANA database cluster one and it's comprised of uh, three LPARs the 190 and 191 are my DB instances and then the corresponding app server and then my other VM workgroup is made up of four which is two DB instances and two corresponding app servers it doesn't say that based on the name but that's how we actually have them configured um, if I click on the host group itself that's where I can go into the uh, edit work groups and if I go ahead and I let this load what you'll see is since I've already got them defined um, you will see them on the right hand side and here you see uh, my DB cluster 2 if I try to edit DB cluster 2 you'll see the four corresponding VMs and I can go ahead and modify this work group and then same thing if I uh, select the HANA DB cluster 1 which is what I called my other VM work group you'll see the three corresponding VMs and I can go ahead and change those values um, so from here you can go ahead and edit those guys and uh, make them fit uh, as the need may be for your particular environment. The other piece that I thought was cool, if I go into the actual uh, flash unit and I go into the copy services section and start taking a look at my uh, uh, particular consistency groups, uh, the nice thing is it automatically creates those consistency groups accordingly based on my VM work groups. So it took all of those uh, LUNs that are getting replicated and the appropriate relationships and basically created a disk grouping for the particular uh, work group that I defined. And then for the second one, you see uh, all of the corresponding LUNs. So that piece is handled automatically behind the scenes. So number four is short and sweet. It's the uh, tunable that was introduced. Uh, that enables you to disable the automatic management of any newly created VM. Um, so I definitely wanted to go ahead and take advantage of this setting. In the 1.3 release, that setting wasn't even there. When you bump up to the 1.4 release, you do a brand new deployment. What you'll notice uh, when you do a cases manager query system, you get a number of new available settings. And the one that I'm actually highlighting is this one. By default, that VM auto discovery is actually set to enable. So what I've been doing is I come in and I set it to disable. It's a nice to have if you know that you, the cases manager is going to be managing every single one of the VMs on the system. But more often than not, the environments that I play in, I'm managing a grouping of the LPARs on that system. And any time, if you have a cloud-like type of uh, environment, any time that anybody deploys a brand new VM, my cases manager uh, ongoing checks will automatically try to manage somebody else's VM. I may not necessarily want that, and I did not have the option to go ahead and prevent it from doing that in the, uh, in the past. Now that I can, I definitely will be taking advantage of this feature and setting it to disable. Now that does create a little bit of more work for me, where anytime I want to manage new VMs, I have to explicitly manage those VMs, but that's the behavior that I actually elect or choose to do. All right, number five. Number five is kind of cool because they uh, made some enhancements to the actual graphical user interface. So the ones that I'm actually focusing on um, have to do with now the ability to display uh, a section with just the managed VMs that was not there before. So if you look on the left hand side, you see how in version 1.3, it would show you every single one of the VMs uh, on that particular system. Now a lot of those in some of my environments weren't even managed VMs. I, there, there's no reason I should have to take a look at those guys. Um, so that was one of the options and let me go ahead and show you that from the GUI itself. Um, if I go ahead and I click into the actual host group you'll see the underlying systems. So if I expand the contents of the first system you see how you now have a section of unmanaged VMs and a section with managed VMs. So if I expand the managed VMs uh, one of the nice things is that I see just the ones that are managed and if I expand the unmanaged I've got one particular one that I am not managing um, and the other cool thing is that little search bar so if you know that a particular uh, LPAR in your environment is kind of buried in there because you have so many different managed VMs you can now actually filter through and find those VMs so that's kind of a nice to have uh, the other cool thing uh, that was I thought was a nice enhancement is whether I'm doing a move operation at either the host group level or at the site level. If I go ahead and I click on the move host group, it now gives me a little plan. It says, hey, do you want to go ahead and make a, a plan move operation? Do you want to force it? Yes or no. 
But this, the, the little preview option, I thought was actually kind of nice as well. So now I'll know exactly which VMs are going to actually be moved, which VIO servers are actually involved in the mix. And I can go ahead and click on move. And it gives me a little confirmation saying, hey, the last time that I ran the discovery was here. Um, if I proceed with yes, it'll go ahead and uh, continue and initiate the operation. And from the activities tab on the bottom, if I expand it, I'd be able to actually follow through with the different events actually taking place. So kind of see uh, an ongoing logging of the uh, operation itself. Uh, if I exit out, you'll see that it looks exactly the same if I try to move uh, at the site level where I can do planned. Um, I still get the same type of plan, except it showed me the actual host group and then the underlying VMs. And to show you this piece of the recording, I went ahead and I deleted my VM work groups, but it would be the same type of view if I was selecting one of my VM work groups and initiated the actual move operation. So that was another one of the nice things that you get in the 1.4 release. All right, so number six is another short and sweet one. This is one that's come up a number of times in the past. Clients say, hey, I really like the uh, fact that you do all this orchestration, you create the profiles, manage the replication, but what about if I want custom logic to actually get invoked uh, before some of the operations take place or after some of the operations take place? So here, here I'm showing you uh, a screenshot. It was in my HADR configuration and I was actually clicked onto the cases name. And what you'll see is that there's a section here where I can specify my own script path or location on the cases where it would where it, where it would go ahead and invoke my own logic. And you can have those pre or post event scripts performed uh, for site level operations, for host group level operations, and then for VM level operations. So if I go into the GUI itself, I can show you what it looks like there in my existing type DR cases cluster config. And here you can see I'm clicked onto the actual cases name in the GUI. If I go to the user script section, it'll go ahead and populate that same exact panel that you saw in the previous screenshot. And I could go ahead and plug in the location uh, where I'm going to have the logic invoked from within the cases itself as pre-logic or post-logic. And then I could go ahead and save and update that particular configuration. All right, so number seven is the enablement of the proactive HA feature. Now this is available for type HA cases controllers and type HADR. It is not there for just the DR cases topologies. And what, what you're going to see if uh, you take advantage of this feature is it's going to give you information based on uh, VIO server based processor utilization, any type of uh, memory issues that you may be encountering, uh, file system utilization, in addition to other things. Uh, the, the, goal here is to kind of bring to light if there's any underlying issues that are going to potentially cause you a headache and if you needed to evacuate a host you could go ahead and be proactive about it as well um, so by default this feature is actually disabled you can come into the GUI and actually set it to enabled and just to give you an example um, I captured a screenshot from one of my cases controllers after I enabled the feature and you'll notice on the bottom left that I was getting a file system space warning when I clicked on view details it went ahead and expanded the, the right hand side and basically started telling me that my var file system was actually uh, getting full uh, let me take you into the GUI and show you the contrast between two different cases, one that has the option available and one that does not have it available. All right, and what I did now is I came into my HA cases and I'm clicked on the top left on the actual cases name. And what you'll see is uh, the option for the proactive HA is right there in the center. If I select it, I had already enabled it. And what I was able to get um, when I clicked on my various resources um, was basically notifications where I could see the details on the right hand side. That is not one of the applicable ones. Uh, but in contrast, if I clicked on my DR cases, that option is actually not there. However, it was there when this cases was defined as type HADR. Either way, this is going to prove to be a useful feature to get those additional uh, metrics and reporting and make you aware if there's any type of underlying condition so that you can go ahead and take actions. All right, number eight is kind of a two-parter. In the previous HA series recordings, I had talked about uh, the different VM agent monitoring capabilities where you could go ahead and copy the package inside of the VM and define applications that, which would control the start and stop and the monitoring of your application. Uh, now you can take it a step further in the 1.4 release. So just to kind of recap and give you a, a little review, uh, you can take the package Maybe, whether it's the AIX one, in this instance, it would be the example of a Linux RPM package being copied over. I went ahead and I SCP'd it over to my uh, VM. And if you look on the top left, you'll see that this was on ATSSG 190. 
um, I copied the SUSE package and I went ahead and I installed that RPM. Now next steps to go ahead and enable the VM level monitoring so that if a single VM fails, the cases will go ahead and restart it for me. I would need to go ahead and enable the HA monitoring and run a discovery and verification. So simply installing the agent as one piece, I can go ahead and come in, click on the uh, uh, VM itself inside of the GUI. Uh, notice that, that that's, there's the same VM, ATSSG 190. I went ahead and I enabled the HA monitoring. And if I click on update policies, from there, I would want to go ahead and make sure that I run a discovery and verification. And what you're looking for is that VM monitor state, uh, state to go ahead and change to started. I did go ahead and do it for all the other VMs individually, but to get the VM level monitoring at the most basic functionality, that's all that you have to do. Now, in addition to that, you can go ahead and take advantage of the uh, agents that we provide for various applications. And we have one for Oracle, one for DB2, one for HANA, one for Postgres. And then we also have the custom uh, application framework where you can go ahead and provide your own startup, stop, and monitor logic. In this example, I was playing with an Oracle agent. If I was doing the probing from within the VM, you could see uh, the status of that actual application monitor framework. Um, and then the different colors have different meanings. So green, good, yellow, meaning that it experienced something, red, meaning that it's actually down. I covered those in detail in the HA series recordings, uh, but some of the things that you could do before, in addition to just simply having the application in place defined uh, because of that agent, you could set up things like start sequences. So you could say app one is set to start first, followed by app two, followed by app three, or I could have parent-child dependencies where within the VM, if a specific application needed to come online first, followed by another one, I could set up those types of relationships. So again, if app one wasn't there, app two would have never gotten started. App one fails, app two would have actually been taken offline as well. What you can do now in the 1.4 release is now you can have cross VM dependencies. So what's cool about that, if I look at the parent-child dependency example, I might have an application running in VM1, and then I can now set up a cross VM parent-child dependency where VM1 needs to come online, and maybe I started both of the VMs at the same time, but that application needs to come online first, followed by application two. And then if I wanted to kind of orchestrate it across other VMs, and I had that same type of parent-child dependency, I can now set up those relationships going across VMs. And then the other piece that I can go ahead and define is I can have a primary and secondary dependency. Uh, so as an example, if I had an SAP HANA configuration, and we now provide an agent for HANA that basically monitors the HANA system replication, so I could have the first VM managing the primary instance of HANA and then the secondary instance of HANA. So if it detected a failure, it can go ahead and reverse roles and make the secondary the primary uh, automatically. So again, those are some of the nice cool enhancements that you get in the one that four updates. Number nine has to do with the DR rehearsal feature. So in my previous recordings, I actually did go ahead and demonstrate this capability, but I was doing the operations via CLI. Um, so let me go ahead and take you into the GUI and what you can do with it today. All right, so if you look now, uh, what I pulled up on the screen is basically a portal or a view into the VM Recovery Manager GUI on the right, and then I've got both HMCs in my configuration. ATS-16 up on the top left, where the active LPARs are actually actively running, and then on the bottom I've got uh, HMC-17, which is currently hosting my cases controller, the one that I'm actually operating on, and is not hosting any other LPARs. So just to show you, once I go into the GUI itself, and if I start expanding, for starters, I'll show you, here's my primary storage subsystem. If I look under the disk group tab, you can see that I'm set up for that tertiary disk copy. That's effectively the flash copy relationships that I went ahead and, and primed to go ahead and get this functionality in place. And if I now wanted to perform a DR rehearsal operation, I can do it at the site level. I can also do it at the host group level. If I had VM work groups, I could do it at the VM work group level. But what I'll go ahead and do, and sh uh, since I had already demoed this in the previous recordings, and I had done it via CLI because the GUI had not been updated, let me show you what it looks like now. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll let it go. I'll speed it up so to save you the uh, uh, suspense. 
But when I go ahead and I tee it off, I also do get the preview. So it's going to be doing it for this host group. These are the VL servers involved. And these are the VMs that are actually going to get cloned. Um, and it's going to light up on those flash copy volumes. So if I go ahead and I start it up, I'll do the start failover rehearsal. It's going to ask me, am I sure that I want to go ahead and do this? And then it's going to put me into this mode up top. Now, the important thing here is I'm probably going to want to do uh, view the detail. Notice that one of the notes that it tells you in the center, it says other operations will be blocked during the failover rehearsal. So I can no longer do plan moves um, or anything until I exit and clean up uh, the, the failover rehearsal operation or the DR test operation. And then if you look at the activities on the very bottom, one of the things that you'll probably want to do is basically expand it so that you see what it's actually doing. And what you'll see is I'll let it run for a while the VMs will effectively start getting cloned on the bottom HMC on the second system, uh, the other S822, and uh, I'll just kind of let it do its thing. But you see how the the view is totally different. I did not have to go through the multiple CLI operations uh, like I showed in the previous demonstration and the other recordings. Uh, this was just simply point and click, it validated, and now it's taking care of everything else behind the scenes. So let me go ahead and let it go, and then I'll start talking again whenever the uh, operation actually completes. Now, I did go ahead and speed it up on purpose. Um, I didn't want you to sit there and me talk through every single one of the operations for several minutes. But one of the things you may have noticed if you paid attention to the actual speed up was that I did do a refresh on the bottom HMC because it was not populating the screen. Um, that was just helping out the actual browser. But you'll see that currently my VMs are actually deployed. I'm in the DR rehearsal mode. I could go ahead and access these VMs on the bottom, um, operate on them. They are playing off of the flash copy volumes. And then whenever I'm done uh, performing my DR testing, I can go ahead and simply click on the uh, clean up and exit. I'll go ahead and execute that now. I'll let it complete. And again, I'll speed this particular section up and then uh, we'll proceed. Um, another one of the things that I can go ahead and do is update some notes. Um, so I can say something like uh, successful site DR rehearsal. On, let's say, 4.3. So I can save off a note. If I wanted to put any additional details, they would get saved off. Submit. And Notice that it tells me that a cleanup is actually in uh, progress. I can click on view details so I see when it actually terminates. And then what I may also do is expand the activities window so I actually see what it's actually doing on the bottom of the screen. Now, hopefully, if the browser continues to refresh for HMC 17 on the bottom left, you'll see the VMs actually starting to go offline. And then you'll see them, see them automatically go, get deleted. And right now, I see the operations going. And there it went. I could scan through the uh, events in the GUI itself and see uh, what was actually taking place, some of the timestamps, but you saw how simple it was to go ahead and basically point and click through the GUI server versus having to do it via CLI like I showed in the previous recordings. And finally, number 10. Uh, the reports function that was actually added into the graphical user interface. It does kind of tie in with the DR rehearsal option that I covered in number nine. So let me go ahead and take you to that now. So what's cool about this feature is that we did the DR rehearsal in number nine, and it kind of left me thinking, well, how long did the operations take? Um, so they added this nice little report function up on the top of the uh, GUI that I can go ahead and click on. And I can now, I did go ahead and load service pack one. So before I only had access in 140 to the failover rehearsal report, I've also got reports on the discover operation, different verify operations, and if I do the combined operation. But let me show you what this looks like. Um, it automatically caches up and pulls up the reports for the last six months. And what it does is it's tell, it tells me how many DR rehearsal operations I actually did. I've done four so far, the average number of VMs and the average amount of time that it took to complete. But I can look at the individual operations that I actually performed. And you can see that it'll show me things like uh, my most recent failover rehearsal. It actually took 13 minutes for me to uh, uh, take or have that uh, DR rehearsal operation get completed. 
Um, it tells me how long I actually sat um, in the uh, DR rehearsal mode, and then how long it actually took for the, oper the cleanup operation, as an example, uh, to complete. The little note that I appended in step number nine, um, where I said it was a successful DR operation on uh, April 3rd, you see the little note saved off there. So you could see how the various uh, operations that I had done in previous dates, here was another one from a April 1st, um, it'll tell me how long those operations took. If I went ahead and I selected something else, like a discover and verify operation, I could actually select a date range, and maybe I want to go from the 31st all the way to the 3rd and uh, generate a report. So this is the combined operations that I executed. It'll tell me the date, which uh, when they actually took place, and how long those operations actually took. So you see how on one day it took three minutes, and another day it took seven. Maybe I had made some uh, different changes to the deployment. And then uh, the most recent one that I actually took, it only took five minutes. So again, it gives you a nice sense as to how long each of the operations actually will take. So you have a, an average amount of time to guesstimate in the event that something was taken longer than you would actually expect. So that was it. That was the top 10 things that I thought might be useful for you to know in 2020 uh, for the 1401 release. Uh, we should have another update coming mid-year and then a brand new release towards the end of the year. Um, feel free to add any comments uh, or subscribe to the channel. And thanks for taking the time to listen.